Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing slow channel myasthenic syndrome. Okay, so we're in the process of discussing what is the subunit composition of uh, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors which you have on skeletal muscle cells which are going to respond to the acetylcholine that's been released by the alpha motor neurons uh, at the neuromuscular junctions. Right, so the heteropentamer, um, oh sorry, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor that is on uh, skeletal muscle cells is a heteropentamer and its subunit composition is alpha-1-2, beta-1, delta epsilon. So this tells you how much of each of the subunits you have. You have two alpha-1 subunits. You have one beta-1, one delta, and one epsilon. But this doesn't tell you how to actually stick them together relative to one another because they have to have a specific way in which they are stuck together. You can't just put these however you like. So here is the receptor viewed from the top. So effectively we're drawing this picture here again, but we are looking down from above. Okay, right. So you have these five subunits making up this nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so you have an alpha-1 subunit here, and then the other alpha-1 subunit goes there. In between them is the epsilon subunit. Up here is the beta-1 subunit, and there is the delta subunit. Okay, so let's add some colour onto this to make it look more interesting. So you have these alpha-1 subunits here in blue, so here's the one and here's the other, okay, and then they are split apart by another subunit, which is always the epsilon subunit, and I'll just talk about this for a moment because the epsilon subunit is what you use in the adult neuromuscular junction nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So this is the adult form of the neuromuscular junction uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, so adult NMJ for short, neuromuscular junction, uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. However, when you're in the womb, when you're a fetus, you don't use this form of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Instead, you use a slightly modified form, so in fetal neuromuscular junction, um, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Instead, the composition is alpha-1-2, okay, beta-1, delta, gamma this time. Okay, so it's almost identical, except that you take this epsilon subunit out, and then you bring a gamma subunit in and plonk that in there uh, the same, uh, well, instead. Um, so it's almost identical, it's just modified, you're modifying one subunit. You're changing this epsilon to a gamma. Okay, and that's what uh, you have whilst you're in the womb. When you actually uh, turn into an adult, when you're born, uh, they're replaced by these uh, adult neuromuscular, well, they're gradually, it's not instant, but they're gradually replaced by the adult neuromuscular junction nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Right, so let's finish colouring in our picture. So we then have the beta-1 subunit here in um, bright green. And then finally, what colour would make the picture look nice? I think orange. We'll put orange in. So delta can be in orange here. Okay, so now, where are the acetylcholine binding sites on this receptor? Because we're looking at the extracellular face. We are looking from this side, and that's actually important. Because if you think about looking up from the other side, the picture you'll get is very different from this. You'll see this picture sort of inverted basically. Imagine spinning this sort of 180 degrees. It'll look quite different, okay? Um, so uh, we are looking from above basically. Right, okay, so uh, now um, let's talk about where the acetylcholine binding sites are since we're looking from the extracellular face. The acetylcholine binding sites should be somewhere all around here. Um, so the acetylcholine binding sites are not actually on a specific subunit. Instead, they are made up uh, by the intersection, well, not the intersection, the interface, that's the word I'm looking for, the interface between one subunit and its neighbour. So they're actually in the cavities between neighbouring subunits. So, for instance, you have one acetylcholine binding site here between this alpha-1 subunit and this delta subunit. Then you have another acetylcholine binding site here 
between the alpha 1 and the epsilon subunit here. So there are two acetylcholine binding sites here. Right, so these are both acetylcholine binding sites. A, C, H binding sites. Right, okay. Now, let's just summarize the neuromuscular junction now with what we've uh, learned, and then we'll move on to slow channel myasthenic syndrome. Right, so... Basically, the alpha motor neuron will fire an action potential. This will make its way down the axon to the axon terminal and trigger the exocytosis, that is the word I'm looking for, and the exocytosis of the neurotransmitter, uh, which in this case is acetylcholine, into this cleft between the alpha motor neuron presynaptic membrane and the sarcolemma of the skeletal myocyte. The acetylcholine will then diffuse across that cleft and bind to these uh, alpha-1, 2, beta-1, delta, epsilon nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Two acetylcholines bind to each receptor. This causes the receptor to change conformation. It then opens the pore. The pore becomes slightly wider. Okay, And what then can happen is uh, sodium ions can move through this receptor. It's actually slightly more complicated than that. The receptor is permeable to monovalent cations. It's actually permeable to both sodium and potassium. Okay, so let me just discuss this for a while. So here is our nicotinic acetylcholine receptor here. Okay, and it's actually when it opens, it's going to allow both sodium ions and potassium ions to move through its pore. Okay. So, why have I only mentioned the sodium coming in? Well, because the sodium coming in is going to be more important than the movement of potassium through this channel. So, let me talk about this. So, basically, um, the sodium concentration extracellularly is around 145 millimolar. The sodium concentration intracellularly is around 12 millimolar. The concentration of potassium intracellularly is around 155 millimolar, and the concentration of potassium extracellularly is around 4 millimolar. Okay, so this means you've got a sodium gradient that is favouring the movement of sodium in. Okay, so this is the movement of sodium. It wants to come in, uh, simply because, you know, there's a 12-fold gradient. So the chance of a sodium ion hitting the channel from the extracellular side and going in is 12 times bigger than the chance that the sodium ion will hit from the intracellular aspect and go out. So you're going to get a net movement of sodium in. Similarly, you've got a movement of potassium, well, the concentration gradient of potassium is out, basically. There's a 40-fold, or thereabout, gradient of potassium across the membrane, so you'd think that this movement of potassium out would far outweigh the movement of sodium in. So that doesn't seem to make sense, because if you're going to move more potassium out than you move sodium in, then that means the net movement of positive charge will be out, okay? And that should hyperpolarize the electrical potential difference across the membrane, not depolarize it. But that's what we're doing. That's, that's the flaw in our argument. We're using this concentration gradient to tell us something about what's going to happen to the electrical potential difference across the membrane, but we haven't actually factored in what the electrical potential difference of the membrane will do to these net movements of sodium and potassium. So, the resting membrane potential across a skeletal muscle cell is generally massive. Okay, so let me just uh, remind you what it means to take the electrical potential difference across a membrane. So, basically, if you have a little man standing in the extracellular compartment, he can measure the electrical potential there. So I'll label this big E for electrical potential, and then big E down here for um, extracellular. Okay, and then... You can also, this little man can move into the intracellular compartment and he can measure the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment. Okay? And these two numbers will not be the same, basically. So, when we say the electrical potential difference or the voltage across the membrane, now, what we really should say is the voltage from extracellular to intracellular. It's directed. However, everyone assumes that you know this. So when people tell you 
uh, talk about the electrical potential difference across the membrane or the voltage across the membrane or the resting membrane potential. What they are talking about is the electrical potential difference if this little man was to move from extracellular to intracellular. So it means how much would the electrical potential he measures change if he moved from extracellular to intracellular. That's what it's asking. It's saying he's standing here measuring some number. So his little machine is showing him a number. If he moves into the intracellular compartment, that number will change. How much has it changed by? That's what people mean by the resting membrane potential or the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane. So it's the electrical potential that's intracellularly, because that's your new electrical potential, minus the old electrical potential, and that tells you how much it's changed when you move from extracellular to intracellular. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.